Okay, so today's speaker is Dr. Joan Najira. She is in Tucson. Um, she's an astronomer and chief scientist in Noir Lab. And um, I think she's just, you got a Simon Guggenheim Fellowship winner, right? You're, she's the winner of Guggenheim Fellowship this year. And she is, she works on um, <clears throat> star formation and planet formation. And I hear is a quote actually. She wrote, uh, I study how stars uh, form from interstellar clouds and how disks surrounding young stars evolve to produce planets and chemical ingredients of life. Cool. <laughs> so uh, she works on, she's an expert on star and planet formation and especially gaseous components of planetary disk at, and um, at the planet forming distances. And she works on the uh, gas dissipation time scale and try to constraints on planet formation theory and also possible dynamical and chemical signatures of this turbulence and magnetic rotation and stability and so on. She works on a lot of uh, topics and she's a collaborator with me and many of us here on Earth and other solar system. Um, so it was been really great to work with her and also personally have a lot of fun. I've known her for 18 years and it was amazing. Um, oh, I did not um, introduce about this. So she received a bachelor's degree in Harvard and she uh, got a PhD at Berkeley and she was a student of Frank Xu, uh, the Bible of the Star Formation uh, author. Uh, it was really great to, um, it's really great to have you around and I'm having a lot of fun. Um, so this is my introduction and if anybody I want to add, um, please go ahead. Otherwise we'll start. Thanks. Um, thanks so All much, right, Serena, John, the floor is yours. Oh, thanks. Um, thanks so much for uh, um, the nice introduction and for to the, all the organizers for inviting me to um, share some thoughts and ideas today. And thanks to everyone for um, joining. Uh, it's really nice to be with uh, more people in uh, these uh, difficult times. Um, so today, um, Oops, somehow I'm not able to, oh, there we go. Okay, so today I wanted to um, really talk about the second topic here, this um, uh, high resolution spectroscopy, mid infrared spectroscopy of a particular class one source, um, uh, a study that I recently completed with um, these co-authors, uh, John Carr, Sean Britton, uh, John Lacey, Matt Richter, and Greg Dotman. Um, but where I think we are observing uh, accretion in action at the surface of a disk. Um, but to set that up, I wanted to give a kind of a longer introduction about um, accretion in star and planet formation and starting with a, a few details about stellar accretion and then talking a little bit about the history of results and ideas related to disk accretion. So I hope you can bear with me on this um, sort of longer introduction. And uh, please feel free to um, ask any clarify any questions um, uh, throughout. Uh, that's that would that would I would really appreciate if there's uh, something I could add to make it uh, something more understandable. Um, okay, so let's get started. So we're all um, fans of um, star and planet formation. So of course, disks are very important to us, and that's basically because um, you know the stuff from which stars and planets form. Uh, have some amount of angular momentum. So when they collapse, uh, some of the excess angular momentum goes into orbit around the star in a disk. Uh, and these, uh, we all know that material uh, spirals in from the outer disk to the inner disk, eventually making its way onto the star. And while it's in transit, planets can also form there and the process of accretion can affect the outcome of uh, planet formation. So for example, when we look at the demographics of exoplanet populations, there's great diversity, of course, as we all know, where there's mass and here's orbital separation. But in particular, there are uh, cold gas giants at large radii, as well as giant planets at smaller radii. And so the hypothesis is that these planets really form at large radii, but migrate into smaller radii through the action of disk accretion. So disk accretion plays a role in how stars assemble their mass and 
in the outcome, the resulting architectures of exoplanet systems. So what do we know about this process? Well, first we know that we believe it's actually happening. And why is that? That's because as this material spiral in, spirals in from the outer disk to the inner disk, the part we can actually see is when it makes its way onto the star and we observe stellar accretion um, uh, in many stars. And we can tell that, for example, it increases with stellar mass or that stellar accretion decreases with age. So all stars seem to participate in this, but exactly how does this happen? That's one of the uh, enduring mysteries of star and planet formation. Some parts of the story we do know, for example, the part about the last bit of the, the journey, how the material makes its way from the disk onto the star. And just as a bit of a review of the ideas, in the old days, like in the tin age, there was a question whether stars um, accrete their matter through uh, a boundary layer or something else. So one idea was that you have the disk and it butts up right against the star and you want to take material that's rotating at Keplerian velocity and have it spin down enough to be able to join on to a star that's more slowly rotating. And so the idea was that this transition would be made in a narrow annular region called a boundary layer. But other people thought, well, you know, stars, they're fully convective, these young stars. And so perhaps they have these, you know, organized magnetic fields, maybe dipole kind of fields, and they might couple to the disk, to the inner disk in this sort of way. And if they do that, then material from the inner disk might be able to climb on to these magnetic field lines. The stars, as the material flows into the magnetosphere, it's trying to spin up, but the magnetic field um, connected to the disk slows it down, so angular momentum is transported back out to the inner disk and carried away in a wind or a jet. So here are two different ways for material to join onto the star. Which of these is correct? Um, well, that's where observations can come in. And so you might think, well, if I have, um, what does this boundary layer look like? It's a thick band around the center of the star and it's rotating. So we would expect to see something that looks like rotation here. But when we actually look, at the accreting material, it looks, it looks different. So people have studied these kinds of line profiles forever. There's all kinds of hydrogen lines in the optical. Here's just a couple from my own work on bracket gamma. And you see that they don't really look like those double peaked disc profiles. Uh, some of them look really weird, like this one has, I don't know, it's got an absorption thing here and a sharp emission thing here. And remarkably, these kinds of weird profiles are you know, really predicted by theory of these magnetospheres. And so the agreement between theory and observations uh, makes us pretty confident that the way in which things happen is more like this rather than like this. So having, um, I think, answered the question of how the last bit of the journey works, how material from the inner disk makes it way onto the star, Really, the big question is what happens before that? How does material go from the outer disk to the inner disk? And that question has um, one of the most important ideas over the last dec few decades has been the magnetorotational instability. And here we have a disk that's differentially rotating and threaded by weak uh, magnetic fields, and they act like little rubber bands. And so um, as material is differentially rotating, it stretches the magnetic field, which causes it to generate this turbulence. And the turbulence transports angular momentum in the sense that some of the material in the disk acquires most of the angular momentum, allowing it to move to large radii, while the rest of the material um, is able to accrete onto the star. And this process only works if the material in the disk is ionized enough to grab onto those magnetic field lines and join in the fun. So that part is actually a challenge for protoplanetary disks because their sources of ionization are kind of limited. So the very inner part of the disk um, where the disk might be hot, like a thousand degrees, there's enough collisional ionization for the material to be able to grab onto the magnetic fields. 
And even observations can show that uh, there's observational evidence for supersonic turbulence coming from this region of the disk. So the kind of turbulence that you expect to be generated by the MRI under the conditions, high ionization conditions of the inner disk, that's where we actually see um, turbulence occurring. So that part is relatively easy, but in the region of the disk that we really care about, the planet formation region, from a couple of tenths of an AU out to 10 AU, uh, this is a little bit more challenging. And the reason is because there's no collision ionization now. So we just have external sources of ionization and the disk is very um, large in column density and these ionization, external sources of ionization cannot penetrate the entire disk layer. So this led to um, a, a really interesting idea 25 years ago um, in this paper by Charles Gammy called layered disk accretion where it, only the surfaces of the disk would be ionized enough to participate in accretion. And we have these two active layers of accretion sandwiching a non-accreting dead zone. Now the active layers, because um, in Charles's paper, the surface, the source of ionization was cosmic rays, the active layer was really thick, like a hundred grams per square centimeter. And so if you have these really thick layers, the, your, the bread of your sandwich is really thick, even a small uh, alpha, viscosity alpha of only 0.01 is enough to drive an accretion rate comparable to what we see if detour starts to 10 to minus eight solar masses per year. And if this all held up, then we would have been done 25 years ago. But it's a lot more complicated because since then, um, both uh, our understanding of the sources of ionization and the non-ideal MHC processes have made it more tricky. So um, the source of ionization in the planet formation region is probably X-rays rather than cosmic rays. And that limits the active column to not 100 grams per square centimeter, but something smaller, maybe like 10 or one gram per square centimeter. And then if we consider in addition to resistivity, uh, things like ambipolar diffusion, then um, that further shrinks the layer to something less than a gram per square centimeter, maybe 0.1 gram per, grams per square centimeter or something like that. And so under these, if you only have a very tiny sliver of bread in your sandwich, it's unclear that the magnetorotational rotational instability can really deliver the kinds of accretion rates that we see um, of T toy stars. The upside of course, is that if accretion is really occurring close to the surface, like this picture suggests, it's good for observations because we might be able to observe it. So let's come back to that part. So since the MRI has been having um, some problems, other ideas have emerged to uh, try to explain what's happening. So rather than, and so then one picture is that of magnetized winds. And so rather than using the weak fields to generate turbulence in the disk, here they're used to generate winds that can remove angular momentum from the disk. Um, now these uh, fields are still weak. And so they, uh, amount, the amount of angular momentum they can re remove per unit mass is limited. So they're not like strong wires, but they're like rubber bands or, some, or wet noodles or something like that. And so the angular momentum per unit mass that they can remove is, is limited. And so you end up needing pretty hefty mass accretion, mass loss rates, comparable or sometimes greater than the disk accretion rate in order to remove the necessary angle of momentum. Um, and so the, uh, in a couple, a couple weeks ago in Ilaria Pascucci's talk, she gave some really terrific evidence showing the kinds of observations that could potentially probe this mass loss process. And so some of the open qu questions associated with those observations are, exactly how much mass loss do they carry and how much angular momentum uh, do they remove? Now, some you can kind of tell that some of the discussion here is really um, about humans, we humans and how we're struggling to understand how disks solve their angular momentum problem. Um, of course, disks know how to do that. It, it, they make it happen. And so, you know, it might be useful to kind of think about, to, to let them speak for themselves and 
say something about how they're actually making it work. Um, and one of the ways is to just, is to uh, avoid looking at the processes in detail and just look at some general stuff. So like disk sizes. And one of the reasons is that um, there's, there, it seems like there's a pretty simple argument that if there's some kind of in-disk angular momentum transport mechanism, like the MRI or something else, that redistributes angular momentum within the disk, then this would have to get larger with time because some amount of the matter has to take up the excess angular momentum and move to larger radii, causing the spreading and allowing the rest of the material to accrete. But if most of the, if the disks solve their angular momentum problem through winds where angular momentum is removed from the disk, then disks don't need to spread. They could in fact shrink, not only because of winds, but because of other processes too, like photo evaporation. So FUV from the star can shine on the disk and remove the outer region of the disk, making it smaller. We can also have the formation of stars and planets, um, companions in the disk which can alter the structure of the disk and hasten photo evaporation, also making this smaller. And so one way to get a handle on what kinds of processes are involved in um, accretion is to look at disk sizes. So if disks, if in-disk angular momentum transport is important, then disks would tend to get larger with time. But if they aren't important, then very likely, and especially if winds are important, then they could shrink with time. So this is, these kinds of data are um, actually available. So if we look at you know, the Titori disks, class two disks, their sizes have been measured for decades. And more recently, people have been measuring the sizes of class one gas disks as well. So these are you know, gas measurements, not dust measurements. Um, and so if uh, uh, ang in-disk angular momentum transport is important, then we would expect to see disks grow with time, but if it's not efficient, then they may shrink. So let's look at some results. So um, class one disks tend to be pretty small, maybe like 100 AU in size. And as we know from decades of study of Titori disks that they are, they, they range in size from small to very large. So while some disks may not be growing for any number of reasons, there do seem to be some very large disks, which suggests that at least for some disks and some of the time, some kind of in-disk angular momentum transport mechanism is significant enough to cause this kind of uh, growth of gas disks. So what could these, um, what could these mechanisms be? So currently we have uh, at least a couple of ideas here about how disks solve the angular momentum problem in the planet formation region. We could have magnetized winds or you know, some kind of in-disk angular momentum transport mechanism that's suggested by the growth in disk sizes. So how can we distinguish between, or you know, maybe both of these processes are at work? How will we know? Well, just like can we- a, um, Joan, can I ask you a quick question on the previous slide of the, with the increasing disk sizes? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm just wondering about uh, sort of the modeling of this in terms of, you know, if you take a sort of simple, like if you take a simple viscous disc profile, you know, simple like alpha model, right? There's a clear fraction of how much goes out versus in um, that you can calculate and compare to observations. Cause I'm just wondering about that versus other processes. Maybe you're gonna get to this in more in more detail later, but obviously as things get spread out, they get fainter and colder. And so the translation to observing a larger disk and having stuff spread out is not totally trivial, at least it doesn't seem it would be. So I'm wondering about, yeah, thinking about some of those effects versus saying, well, maybe some of the class disc, class one disks you observe are young class ones and then they've accreted more material and that's why it's there, you know, can, can brightness temperature profiles, things like that. Is there anything else we can say about it other than they're bigger or smaller? Yeah, those are all great questions. I'll just say that um, when I was thinking about this particular, you know, this particular plot, I talked to other people who work on observations of disks and said, well, how much, can you tell me how much mass is really out here, you know, just to answer your question, because there's a specific prediction. And it's just really hard. I mean, you know, measuring masses of things, gas disks is just, you know, 
from direct gas tracers, we all know the, the struggle. Um, so currently, I, I don't know if we can answer those questions, although I see that there's some other experts online, so maybe there's more insight there. But um, I'll just say that the size seems to be an issue, but yes, the mass would be even better. Um, so maybe just stop there and if uh, we can come back to it later, if there's uh, some time. Okay, um, Okay. so, so I was saying, um, we've got a couple of different ideas about how disks are solving the angular momentum problem here. Which of these is right? Maybe it's both. How would we know? Well, could we make some observations of what's going on in this region? You know, just like we were able to make some observations of the star part to help figure out what's going on. Okay, so that's the longer introduction um, to what I wanted to share today, which is about um, this particular class one source called GV Tau. It also has these other names for uh, aficionados of Taurus. And um, as we know from observations of its molecular envelope, it has both weak gas and dust emission, suggesting that it's a more evolved kind of class one source, you know, transitioning to a Tauri star. It's also a binary, a 1.2 arc second binary. And um, the one of it, the interesting one for this particular study is the Northern component, which is the more embedded one. So um, looking back, um, wow, 15 plus years, I think, um, when Spitzer data were first rolling in, um, there was some something interesting that uh, I noticed. So here is a spectrum uh, from Spitzer, and here uh, of GV tau north, and you see going from five microns to 25 microns. There's the silicate absorption feature, well known, and then something interesting going on right over here between 13 and 16 microns. So first, you see a lot of fringing, so just ignore that. But this is uh, CO2 ice, and um, Next to the solid state feature are some gaseous bands of CO2 in absorption, HCN in absorption, and acetylene in absorption. Uh, now, these are the same bands. For those of you who like Spitzer, you might realize those are the same bands that we see in emission. So here's an emission spectrum of a T-Tori star in the same spectral region here. Uh, we see acetylene in emission, hydrogen cyanide emission, and CO2 in emission, so the same things that are seen in absorption here. And so we were really curious to understand, you know, what, what's going on here with this, with this absorption. So we took some more spectra. So here we went to um, use the TEXI spectrograph on Gemini uh, in 2006. And um, this is a R of 100,000 spectroscopy on an infrared optimized telescope. So really uh, well suited for this kind of study. And here's our first observation over here. So this is, um, Texas is a cross dispersed spectrograph. So you get different orders. And in one order, here we have a nice uh, acetylene line profile for a single line, uh, an ATN line and another acetylene line. And here's a second setup where many more orders. And in addition to acetylene and ATN, Oh, uh, we also detected these green things, which are ammonia. So these are the first detections of ammonia from a disk. Oh, and look here, even there's H2, molecular H2 in emission. Um, so it was exciting to discover uh, something new with the ammonia. And so the second year, we went back and got more observations of ammonia and um, also observations that included water absorption. So now we're detecting quite a number of molecules all with these resolved line profiles, and what do they look like? So if anybody's interested, I have lots of line profiles to show you, but these they basically look kind of like this. So here's a spectrum normalized in flux, so the, it's one in the continuum. This green line is the system, the system velocity from the molecular envelope. And here you can see that the line profiles have a, a core component and this wing. So the core is is red shifted by about four kilometers per second. It has a 10 kilometer per second width. And then this wing of uh, higher red shift, higher red shift um, absorption. Now, if we normalize all the line profiles so that they go from zero at the base of the absorption to one in the continuum, then they look like this. So you can see there's this core part and then there's 
a, a stronger wing part for the water. And um, to make the analysis simple, we can just divide this up into two components. So let's call this part the low velocity component and this part the higher velocity component. Then we measure the equivalent widths for all of our features and then see what we can learn. So as you probably know, um, the absorption that you see in equivalent width is a function of the filling factor of the absorber times this factor one minus e to the minus tau, where the optical depth is a function of temperature, column density of the absorber, and its intrinsic width. So you could fit all your equivalent width and infer these four quantities. So what do we learn? Well, first we found that the absorption temperature for all of the molecules was the same, about 450 degrees. And if we make column density ratios like acetylene to water or HCN to water, that we might think of these as abundances, we can plot them on a abundance plot of acetylene to water and HCN to water, and our observations land here. So the same part of the plot as where the emission properties from inner disks are found with Spitzer. So the temperature and the abundances of our absorber are very similar to those of inner disks. So it quacks like a duck, it walks like a duck. I think it is a duck. I think we're looking at the inner disk in absorption. Uh, that also makes sense because the column densities that we see are really huge. So for the high velocity component, the water column is six times 10 to the 19 or 40 times the column that's typically seen in emission. And for the low velocity component traced by say HCN, where the column density is seven times 10 to the 16 per square centimeter, that's 10 times the column that's typically seen in emission. So I think the geometry looks something like this, where here's the mid infrared continuum. This pink layer is the absorber. So we're looking over here. So we'd see this large column in absorption. But it's the same gas that we would typically see in emission if we were standing over here. It's just that we're looking over here where we see absorption. Now you might say, okay, you're detecting absorption and it's red shifted. How do you know you're not looking at infalling gas? I think there's some good, good reasons why we can say that's not the case. If we were looking at infall, it would subtend a very large range of solid angles. So pretty much from the end of the outflow cavity down to the surface of the disk, we'd see infall. And that would mean that if this kind of absorption really came from the infalling envelope, that we would see it a lot of a high fraction of the time. But in fact, this kind of molecular absorption has only been detected in two sources, GV tau, and this other source, IRS 46. So it's rarity suggests that it's much more likely to be associated with a limited solid angle region, say the surface of a disk, than with infall. Another reason is that we can measure the velocity of the absorption uh, as well as its temperature. And that's, there's a mismatch there because a four kilometer per second infall velocity really corresponds to a great distance, something like 100 AU away where the infalling envelope would have a temperature more like 100 degrees rather than 500 degrees. You'd have to get pretty close to the star to get anywhere close to 500 degrees. Also for envelopes, these are typically lower uh, density regions and cooler as we mentioned. And so those kinds of combinations typically won't lead to the molecular mix that we currently observe. Whereas the, we do know that those kinds of abundances are seen in the inner disk. So for all those reasons, it seems very likely that we're observing the inner disk in absorption. But you might also be wondering why we see these funny looking line profiles. You know, um, well, one idea is that if we're looking at absorption that's displaced from the mid infrared continuum as in this picture. So here, let's say this orange circle is the mid infrared continuum and the absorption is really coming from a larger radius here then it only the projected um, velocities of the absorbing gas span a small range in velocity. So rather than spanning the entire circular velocity around this radius, we're only getting the small piece in front of us. And so if the metaphoric continuum was at say 0.3 AU, 
and the absorbing gas was at something like one AU, then you would end up with a core that's absorption core the feature that's about 10 kilometers per second wide. But we still want to have the absorption be redshifted. And so in addition to having rotation, we also need to have inflow. And so if we sum these green arrows and blue arrows, we end up with these red arrows. And that's how we can shift the velocity um, by four kilometers per second by having inflow at the same kind of velocity. So, so far, we have evidence for an inner disk atmosphere viewed edge on. It has the right kinds of temperatures, the right kind of abundances. It has the high column densities that we expect, but it's inflowing at something like four to 15 kilometers per second. Now, that's the reason why we took the data in 2006, but only finished the paper this year because we had trouble understanding what that inflow velocity was. So, um, but it turned out that a couple years ago, um, you know, the collaborators got together, we were sitting down at a bench at the Aspen Center for Physics, deciding what we were going to actually write. When Zhao Han Zhu came over to us and wanted to share the results of a paper that he had just finished with Jim Stone, and remarkably, it was something related, I think. So Zhao Han's paper was on the global evolution of an accretion disk with net vertical field. And uh, this is basically what he showed us. So here you have magnetic field lines, these green things threading a disk, uh, material near the disk surface is moving in at high velocity. So it pinches the magnetic field like this, which is coupled to the disk at large radii. So now you have material at smaller radii um, that's trying to move ahead of the midplane but it's torqued back, tor it's torqued down by the midplane. So the gas in the uh, atmosphere is rotating at sub velocity, and it also loses angular momentum, so it moves in um, at supersonic speed. So at supersonic inflow velocities of something like two to four times the sound speed, uh, which for the measured temperature for our source turns out to be the four kilometer per second velocity shift. So that was kind of an amazing coincidence. Um, and just for fun, let's look at another plot from John's paper where we can see as a function of height in the disk. So below the midplane and above the midplane, what is the rate of velocity um, versus the sound speed? So in the midplane, it's uh, there's very little velocity, but toward the atmosphere, we see these large inflows of several times the sound speed. It's pretty similar uh, to what we're observing. So we were emboldened by the idea that, well, maybe that really is inflow. And we calculated the um, associated accretion rate because um, I think we have all the numbers to do that. So the accretion rate through the slab is just two pi r, let's say it's one AU, the typical kinds of uh, distances for the absorption we see. And we measured these inflow velocities and then we just have to add the um, perpendicular column associated with the inflow. So we don't measure that, we measure the line of sight column. And we can assume that because of this large uh, slant that the uh, perpendicular column might be one tenth of the absorption column. And then we have to make the more important correction for the fact that we're only observing a tracer molecule rather than the entire thing. And uh, when we do that, uh, this is what we end up with. So for our, we take our observed columns, we use um, disk atmosphere models, like the ones that I made with um, Mati Adamkovich and uh, Al Glasgow, and put it into this little formula. And then we find that the accretion rate associated with the low velocity component is something like 10 to minus eight solar masses per year. And the um, accretion rate associated with the high velocity component is something like 10 to minus seven solar masses per year. So accretion rates comparable to what are seen in T-Tori stars both typical T Tauri stars like 10 to minus eight and very active T Tauri stars like 10 to minus seven. So potentially it looks like we're observing um, disk accretion in action. So this, it's surface accretion um, and that might sound familiar because we were talking about um, Charles Gammy's paper earlier and um, it is surface accretion, but slightly different. So you might remember from, um, uh, our initial discussion that uh, in the original layered accretion picture, 
the surface layer was 100 grams per square centimeter thick, and the inflow velocities would have been less than a meter per second on average. So here we're finding um, accretion through a column that's 10,000 times smaller, only 0.01 grams per square centimeter, and velocities um, several times the sound speed. But with that combination, you can still explain the observed accretion rates onto stars. So uh, just to summarize, uh, looks like we're detecting an atmosphere viewed edge on, it's inflowing, it carries the mass accretion rate of active T Tauri stars. Um, and it might be due to the mechanism that Johan explained in his paper with Jim Stone. Uh, but in preparing this talk, I also looked at another paper um, by Shining Bai, and it looked like potentially there might be some other explanations too. So um, if we look at these kind of magnetocentrifugal driven winds that we were talking about earlier, and one particular flavor where there's the net vertical magnetic field is anti-aligned with disk rotation, uh, we end up with something that's kind of interesting. So here's a plot from Shane's paper. So um, we're looking here at disk height above and below the midplane versus radius. And the color bar is showing mass flux. So blue is inflow and red and yellow are outflow. And so you can see that in this hemisphere, there's a lot of yellow. So there's a strong wind here, whereas there's no wind down here. But in this hemisphere at the disk surface, there is inflow. Uh, and so if uh, in this cross cut at 9 AU, so you know, larger radii than where we're looking, but maybe there's an equivalent thing at smaller radii that's not really studied in this paper, but let's just, let's just pretend that this was a smaller radius. So here's the cross cut at 9 AU, um, where this is velocity versus Kepler velocity and height above and below the uh, midplane. And you can see that in this, uh, the lower hemisphere, the inflow velocity traced by the blue line here gets to be 15% of Keplerian velocity, which is also supersonic. So under specific assumptions in magnetocentrifugal winds, you can also get supersonic inflow, it seems. If you pick the opposite one where the magnetic field is aligned with rotation, you get a different story. You get wind on both sides of the disk. There's midplane, the accretion is in the midplane at some radii, and then toward the surface at others with lower velocities. So I guess we have a couple, we appear to be seeing accretion in action at the disk surface, supersonic accretion, which could be due to either um, the kind of surface accretion flow that Johan explained or possibly this magnetocentrifugally driven wind accretion. Personally, I hope there's some role for this, uh, for Jahan's version, because it is an in-disk angular momentum transport mechanism because the angular momentum from the surface is transported to the midplane in this configuration, which helps to explain um, the growing sizes of disks, apparently. In, um, in Johan's uh, simulation, although these winds, these field lines bend over and allow uh, mass loss in a wind, the wind carries very little angular momentum. So um, there's a potentially interesting connection between this idea and the observed sizes of disks. Now, um, so I think this part is pretty interesting that we may be observing disk accretion in action, but clearly it's only one object. And uh, often, you know, people are reluctant to um, think about anything in particular unless there's like many examples or something. So um, I don't, there's, I don't have anything, uh, a lot to share on that right now, but a quick look at the literature suggests that maybe there's, um, there are more examples waiting to be found. So for example, uh, here's a paper um, from Zhang et al. Uh, 2015, where they did CO fundamental spectroscopy of AA tau, T Tauri star viewed close to edge on. And um, in particular, they looked at how the line profiles changed uh, during a dimming event. So here's the V magnitude of AA tau versus time. And so here it's varying along, varying along, and then suddenly in 2012, it became a lot fainter uh, for several years. 
So what happened to its absorption profile? So here's CO fundamental emission, its emission from the inner disk. And on top of that is some absorption, kind of like what we're seeing in the mid infrared. Um, and what's interesting is that when the uh, dimming event occurred, the centroid of the absorption shifted to the red by something like six kilometers per second. And the temperature of the absorption was 500 degrees, so pretty similar to GV tau, uh, suggesting that perhaps you have your disk viewed almost edge on, you have a dimming event where the atmosphere you know, suddenly becomes denser, it's inflowing, potentially producing these kinds of shifts that we see. Another way in which uh, we might be able to see radial inflow um, is uh, in all, data from ALMA. So here's um, the uh, paper from Walsh et al on ALMA observations of HD 100, 5, or 6. And here's the CO 3 to 2 intensity map and velocity moment map. And in the paper, um, Catherine said that the twist that we see in the velocity moment map uh, going from one uh, angle at large radii to another at small radii, that twist could be fed as either a warp in the disk or potentially radial inflow. And reading closely in the paper, if it's inflow, the in required inflow velocity is um, several times the sound speed. Uh, then there's also another paper that in the literature that seems to be saying something similar. So this is a paper again on AE tau, but now on the outer disk, observed with ALMA, this is a paper by Ryan Loomis et al. And um, here's the HCO plus J equals three to two moment map. And you can see there's also a twist here. Uh, and so they also mentioned that it could be due to either a warp or radial inflow. So um, all of which to say is that uh, it seems to be possible that the uh, disk of this particular class one source uh, is accreting through its surface and not just its surface in the layered accretion kind of way, but through its atmosphere, <laughs> a very thin uh, part of the disk the part that um, people expect to be the most magnetically active because it's the most highly ionized and able to grab on to um, magnetic field lines. Although um, I was just describing the de in detail the results for one particular object, um, it may be that these kinds of radial inflows may be more common uh, in part because we haven't really been looking closely for them or recognize what they might be, uh, what they might represent. Uh, so potentially we'll see more examples of this looking at um, uh, disk absorption features and the velocity shifts, potentially also in um, maps from ALMA. Uh, but my main point is, uh, which is kind of um, uh, just a fun topic, is that um, these kinds of observations suggest that we may actually be able to observe disk accretion action, kind of like what we once did for stellar accretion. And um, perhaps interestingly, those same disk atmospheres that we studied for many years, you know, thinking that they're just the tip of the iceberg and that something really interesting is going on deep in, deep in the disk. Maybe a lot of the action is going on at the disk surface, um, which makes it easier for us to observe. So thanks. All right, thank you, Joan. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question to the speaker, you can either use the raise hand feature in the participants tab, or you can put your question into the chat uh, and we will ask it for you. So any questions for Joan? All right, so I actually had a question going back to the um, the sort of along the same lines of what Caitlin was asking with the, the class one disks being smaller than the class two disks. Um, how uncertain do you think the outer radii are on the class one disks when you have like envelopes blocking the emission from the disk and material potentially still falling onto the system? Like, are, is it factor of two, 10 AU? What, what's your feeling? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. You know, like um, in the in the class one phase, when you have accretion, when you have infall going on, um, the disk 
may may not have actually stabilized to its you know the um, what size it will really have because material is being added and it's sloshing around and things like that. So it's probably pretty hard to say exactly what's going on. I just mentioned that the kind of observations that I'm talking about uh, that people report for the sizes of class one discs are where you, um, you're trying to tell the difference between um, the velocity as a function of radius for, for rotation versus infall. And you know, you're using, using the same tracer to trace both things. So it's kind of messy, but people typically use the break in the slope to, you know, just to say where the disk approximately is. So it's, it's highly approximate. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, if you, you have to take, in, in some sense, you have to take away the infall and, and wait for the disk to, to stabilize itself to know exactly what the initial size of the disk is. Uh, it's not necessarily cooperating to, to show you that, but um, uh, it's in that sense that where you, what, what you're actually trying to get a sense of how big is something before uh, spreading occurs. Um, so there's a lot of caveats, but I would say that um, uh, you know we just we just need more more data, maybe more simulations of the process to really understand what we should be seeing. Uh, but the fact that some disks are 800 AU in size in the tutorial phase suggests that some kind of spreading you know does happen. Um, although if people, if others, you know, have greater insights about the, the observations, that would be good to know. Really appreciate that. All right, thanks. A uh, question from Robert. Uh, hi, John. Uh, great talk. And I apologize that I missed the first 15 minutes or so because of another meeting that ran over. Um, but I was wondering, you know, it's a more general, general question. Uh, in the past, often, you know, stellar system accretion disks have been used as a model or, or um, you know, involved as a model uh, for, for larger systems like accretion disks in, in quasars and around AGN. And I was wondering if you think that this is still the case and it can be used uh, in, in, in that regard. Um, wow. Um, hmm. Can protoplanetary disks tell us something about disks around AGN? You know, the... Well, let's see. Maybe other in, in terms of accretion, uh, yeah. In terms of accretion processes, I mean. Yeah. Uh, hmm. For I think a lot of the the challenges of how disk accretion works for protoplanetary disks are really governed by the fact that ionization is in short supply for them, mm -hmm. and so the um, the contortions that we have to go through to figure out how it works are really that that's why it becomes so difficult. For EGN, I, I'm gathering that's not the major concern. I'm not an expert, but um, it might be easier there to make that all work. From the observational point of view, though, we can get a pretty close look at a lot of what's going on in protoplanetary disks because they're not so far away and because of these kinds of techniques that I was describing. Um, so maybe that's a, maybe that's that's one way to um, to, 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 you know, compare uh, more observations, more detailed observations, perhaps with the protoplanetary disk, but you know, the, the downside of the challenge of ionization. Yeah, yeah, uh, I agree because you know, they are so close and you can study them in great resolution. Uh, you can get insights maybe for the object that I'm talking about, which you know, we, we know nothing about other than the combined light. Yeah. Thank you. If others, have, if others want to weigh in on that, that would be terrific as well. So. Thank you, John. All right, uh, so next question is from Caitlin. Hey, just this is, a, again, following up still on the same issue of the class one or class two disk sizes. Um, can you say anything about what bias you might uh, expect on disk sizes from some of the non-age-based arguments people make for why something appears class one versus class two, right? There's this issue that, you know, Tom Robitaille showed years ago, right? That depending on viewing angle, you might mm -hmm. choose one versus the other independent of age. Is it the case that, you know, you would naturally expect to see this larger spread in the class twos because of some of those viewing angle artifacts? Or do you think the opposite is true? Um, I guess if you're saying, I just have a spectral energy distribution and then I, can I tell whether something's class one or class two? I think you might get into some of those issues. But I think if you have molecular envelopes and other kinds of um, 
gas dynamical things, you could probably tell the difference between the two scenarios. Well, I guess, so maybe I should re-ask the question, are, what, is, what is being used to decide if these are class one versus class two? I know in this case, you actually see, you have some observation of the, the gas, but are these old SED based classifications or? Oh, okay. So like for the, for the sizes, um, the class twos, you know, those are just well-known T-Tori discs. Um, so nothing controversial about those. For the class zero and ones, the, those data that I looked at were taken 20 up to 2017 ish. So, you know, really popular uh, class one and class zero objects that have jets and all kinds of other things that are associated with um, youth. So I, I don't think that's really controversial either. But if one was getting into like the have large statistics and that sort of thing, then probably you want to look into that pretty closely. Okay, but these are not SED based class determinations and or not no, SED, no, the, even though we're still calling them class one or class two as though that were the case. We have better information. Yes. Okay. Yes. Not yeah. just not just the infrared slopes. Yes, yes. Uh, more <laughs> more 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 uh, data that really defines them. Yeah, as being very different kinds of systems. All right. Uh, we have a question from Jeff Kuzi in the chat who asks. Joan, can you go over again the logic about distinguishing layered infall from parent cloud infall using some kind of temperature velocity mismatch? Yeah, sure. Okay, let me see if I, I'll just go back to slide. Sorry. So slow at this. Okay. <laughs> Looks good. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So here was my uh, here was my argument um, about this one. So Jeff's question was about the temperature velocity mismatch. So um, the velocity shift of the core component for TV tau is about four kilometers per second. So let's say you were talking about inflow on infall onto a one or 0.8 solar mass object to get. The, to, to end up with an inflow infall velocity of um, point uh, uh, of four, four kilometers per second, you'd have to be out at pretty large distance, something like 90 AU. Um, and so that and then if we look at the predictions of what molecular envelopes or infall is supposed to, what temperatures the infall would have at such large radii, then the temperature is something like 100 degrees. And you would only get up to the kinds of temperatures that we observe um, close to 500 degrees, pretty close to like within a few AU of the star. So um, at which point you would be, you know, falling at uh, very large velocities, almost 40 kilometers per second. So uh, the small velocity with the high temperature doesn't really make sense for infall. That's my, that's the basic idea. All right, thank you. Um, next question is from Zhao Zhu, also in the chat. And he asks, could the measured infall, sorry, measured inflow velocity due to a twist slash, uh, do, could be, blah, 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 sorry. Um, could the measured inflow velocity be due to a twist slash warped disk? As you mentioned, ALMA observations have two explanations, infall and twist slash warp. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I guess for the, um, all, the all the observations that we see so far uh, for, for the mid-infrared are about the disk at um, probably within an AU or so at the star. So pretty far from what's happening with ALMA. Um, so it's unclear, I think, whether what's happening within an AU really is uh, the simple picture that I described with rotation and infall and inflow, or whether there could be more complicated dynamics uh, in that region that might be due to a, a warp or some kind of other disk dynamics at that same distance. Uh, so um, I think with just the absorption and no imaging or other kinds of spatial information, 
Um, it's hard to say. Um, yeah, I guess I guess we, we should leave that as a potential um, caveat to the to the interpretation. All right. Any final questions for Joan? If not, I invite everyone to unmute and thank her for an excellent talk. And we will see you all same time next week. Thanks, everyone.